this is Eric Topol uh, with Medscape with my colleague and co-host Abraham Verghese. And we've got a really special session today with Robin Cook, Dr. Robin Cook, who I think uh, has 37 medical sci-fi thrillers, a new one that just came out called Viral. Welcome, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. We uh, go back now several years because I know uh, once I had a chance to visit with you uh, in Boston and um, you've, we've had you out for the uh, future genomic medicine um, here in uh, San Diego. But what's striking is that you started a whole genre uh, many years ago. Uh, in fact, I guess maybe you could say you were on a submarine. <laughs> you wrote your first book. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, uh, I had decided I wanted to write a novel about medicine uh, when I, my first year of medical school. And the reason was, is that I was hoping that once I got to medical school, I would just be in a circumstance where I could count on just becoming the best doctor I could. I didn't have to follow that kind of very competitive sort of circumstance. And um, Unfortunately, I realized very quickly, uh, the first meeting in medical school, the dean said and looked up at us and said, listen, five of you will be asked to stay. <laughs> that gave you the idea of what the competition was going to be like. And uh, so I decided I wanted to write a book about medicine because um, all the TV shows I had seen, all the books I had read about medicine, et cetera, all suggested that everything was fine in the medical arena. And uh, I could already see that that wasn't the case. And so I thought that someone should write a fiction book and maybe do a TV series or a movie that showed medicine with its warts, so to speak. You've been doing that really well. <laughs> well, as a medical student, I didn't have any time to write a book. And then when you finish medical school, you graduate to become a resident, and then you have even less time. And, um, and then lo and behold, um, I did get drafted after my surgical residency. And, um, and I found myself in the, in the military, and uh, I did volunteer for submarines. And so I found myself on a submarine, and that's the perfect writing environment. <laughs> I could not excuse the fact I couldn't say I just don't have any time to write <laughs> because on a sub submarine in fact a lot of the doctors at my hospital who were a little jealous of my putting out coma asked me for recommendations because they'd like to do something similar and I said that you should join the navy and volunteer for submarines uh -huh. um, because it's a perfect writing uh, <laughs> environment you're not interrupted by sunrise or sunset. <laughs> um, and uh, um, when you're on the submarine, you work a, um, an eight hour shift. And uh, if you're lucky, you can sleep for eight hours. But unfortunately, there's another eight hours. <laughs> and uh, I took that opportunity to write my first book. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be talking to you, Dr. Cook. And before we get into the things that we'd love to talk to you about. I'm just curious, did you have any uh, books that were models for, for the genre that you wound up inventing? I mean, I think you invented your own genre, but were there books that inspired you or that you took lessons from as you first embarked on Intern and then Coma? Um, yes, very much so, because um, I was very lucky to even get Year of the Intern published. That was my first book. In fact, when I got off the submarine, I came up the, up the ladder uh, clutching this handwritten novel. And somebody said, asked me what I was holding, because it's a little hard to climb the, the ladder in the submarine with a handwritten novel. And uh, I said, I'd written a novel. And they said, oh, that's interesting. Did you know it was really hard to get a book published? <laughs> and uh, I had no idea. That's how little I knew about publishing. Um, so um, the book came out and unfortunately, and no one bought it. <laughs> it uh, in fact, it's now a very rare book because they produce so few. And um, 
So I was very disappointed in that because I thought it was a very interesting issue that I thought that uh, the public would really like to know that um, perhaps we're not training doctors the way we should be training them. And um, that was the, the issue in, in my first book, The Year of the Intern. Since no one bought it, I thought, well, maybe I should go back to the literature. That's what we learn in medical school. And I realized that I had been very, I hadn't read the literature. The literature is what books are bestsellers. And so I, and since I had a lot of friends at the business, Harvard Business School, who um, they teach in the case method and and so I took that to heart and I decided to pick a couple of books that had been successful with people who were not known writers and, and had almost instant success with a book. And the two books I chose to be my studies were um, uh, Jaws and, um, and Love Story. Now they're very different books, but both those authors had never, they were unknown and both of them had very successful books. And um, so I studied, not only did I read the books, which I had not read, but I also studied the way the whole process was put together. And, um, and I have to say that um, I imitated it perfectly in every regard for my second book, Coma. Well, that sure was a is. smashing success <laughs> back in 1977. I think I really got your career in the high gear. I think all, our, us old dogs, the three of us, will remember Coma and its impact. But um, here you are, you've sold more than 400 million books. Is anybody sold more than 400 million books? Yeah, James Patterson. <laughs> okay. Well, you're in a kind of rarefied group there, Robin. Well, I, I think uh, Stephen King has as well. Okay. Well, then there's three of you. But yeah. now you are also practicing ophthalmology throughout the whole time, right? Well, yeah. Actually, I was a resident uh, in ophthalmology when I wrote Coma. And then I did finish. And, um, and interestingly enough, when I finished, since I loved being a student so much, is uh, as soon as I finished my ophthalmology, which was my second residency, I matriculated at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. And, um, uh, and it was while I was a, uh, a student that my, I was also had a small private practice and my beeper went off in the middle of a, of a, a lecture and it was my agent and I went out and that's when Coma sold as a movie. Mm -hmm. And I knew that at that point that I knew that, that Coma had a good chance of following in the footsteps of Jaws and Love Story. Let's get uh, into the new book, Viral, uh, where Robin, you get into the pathogen uh, uh, Eastern Equine Encephalitis, E, triple E, uh, we're going to find out why you picked that particular pathogen, uh, and uh, this outbreak in uh, of a of a woman, uh, Mrs. Murphy, Emma Murphy, uh, and then of course what happens to this family, uh, and dealing with the the villain, which you'll tell us about because I know that's in your magic formula. You have to have a villain. And sometimes <laughs> it's actually the villains are the same from book to book. But anyway, tell us, give us a, a, the skinny on viral and what it's about. Well. Um... It's, I, I have been very concerned about the uh, erosion uh, uh, of medicine because of the intrusion of business interests for a long time. And I, I wanted to write a book about the fact that um, particularly uh, health insurance and chain hospitals as evidence of the fact that they've been kind of taken over with private equity but I could never think of a way of, of writing it and um, nor could my publisher because when I told my publisher I wanted to write a thriller about health insurance, they looked at me sort of cross-eyed. <laughs> Can't write a, a thriller about health insurance. That's perhaps the most boring subject in the world. Um, but um, I guess uh, I realized that um, that 
that not, um, when I looked at movies and I looked at what are the favorite movies, I realized that one of the types of movies that are really favorite are revenge movies. And um, I, I, in fact, when I thought about it and I put in revenge movies to see what would come up, just about every movie that I've ever seen is a revenge movie uh, in some sort of form or fashion. And that suddenly gave me an idea of how to deal with this, um, this issue of, of business type people coming into medicine purely uh, because the profits are so huge. Um, uh, there's an old expression that somebody asked, I can't remember who it was, some, some famous outlaw of why he robbed banks. And he said that he robbed banks because that's where the money is. <laughs> And uh, I think it's the same situation with private equity. Uh, the reason that private equity is so involved in medicine now is because that's where the money is. And um, so thinking of these things and trying to think up of a way of dealing with this issue, uh, uh, particularly about health insurance. Health insurance has bothered me for a long time. And, uh, and I kind of decided to, to, to make it into a revenge novel because when I hear some of the stories and some of the stories that I've, I've read about how people are mistreated um, and how they, they think they have health insurance, they haven't read their policy, that's for sure, um, that this seemed to me to be an opportunity and a, a way to create a story that you're gonna get a lot of people interested in and to read and and then later on, think about it. Um, you know, we have, we've had a, a number of really great books that have been written, nonfiction books, about the problem of healthcare and the, in, the intrusion of business. And they are really very, very good. Um, and um, in fact, I, I read two of them very carefully before I wrote um, Viral and uh, Marty Macquarie's book, um, The Price We Pay and uh, Elizabeth Rosenthal's uh, An American Sickness. But the trouble is that most books like that, unfortunately, are read by people who already know the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's why they read the book, because it, it, you know, it, it, it cements what they have already felt. That's why I actually turned to fiction and to try to get a huge number of people, people who are affected or have been affected or know someone's affected, and that way to get them somehow to get the, the public behind um, what we need to do in this country. And that is to, um, to change the laws, to get our representatives to do something that's gonna be very difficult for them because these stakeholders are giving them so much money uh, on a daily basis. Um, and they don't want anything to change and um, for obvious reasons. And uh, so that's, that's sort of the background of, of how I came up with this, with this idea as a revenge story. Um, and, um, and then you asked about why did I pick uh, Eastern equine encephalitis? Well, it's, it's a problem that's here yeah. in, in Massachusetts. Um, and in fact, last summer we had quite a few cases. I haven't really heard too many cases this year, um, but here in, in, in New England, we've also had, have had a lot of Lyme disease and obviously because it's named for Lyme, Connecticut. Um, and why have, why have these diseases suddenly popped up? Well, that's because of climate change. Mm -hmm. And so, I just love to add in my books all sorts of different issues um, that are real. And, uh, and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll choose a viral illness that climate change is, is making worse or uh, putting us all at risk for. And so it was just another, another issue. Dr. Cook, I was really struck by the fact that you uh, have taken a good, strong stance on, on public health in a way that I think is Maybe a departure from some of your previous books. Uh, your book is dedicated to the fervent hope that members of the U.S. Congress will 
comprehend the need to enact at the very minimum a viable public health care option. And uh, you know, you also mentioned in your preface and your acknowledgments uh, some of your views, especially on SARS. I imagine this is um, this is a controversial opinion, and you probably come up against a lot of a lot of pushback. But it, it's a wonderful way to try and overcome, I suspect, the kind of opposition to reality that we're facing out there. Yes, and it's it's because um, of the of the power of lobbyists, and it's because the Supreme Court decided that uh, uh, giving money to politicians somehow has something to do with free speech. That's why it's not going to change. And I see the only way for it to change is that if the public demands it. Um, and uh, and that's that's why writing a book like Viral and and I hope uh, I will be making a movie of Viral as well in the not too distant future because you can tell just like Coma, it's written. I wrote it actually as a movie first, <laughs> and um, it's in. It's in three books, it says. Well, those are the three acts. And uh, so it's set up very, very carefully in terms of, of classical movie structure. And the idea, I think that if the book is successful enough and if the movie is successful enough, uh, I think it, it could really change uh, public opinion. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people are willing to, to, to jump on the fact that when, when President Trump suggested that he was going to in back these short-term health policies and make medical uh, health care much more affordable for everyone. Well, these short-term health policies are very affordable. The only problem is, is that they don't pay anything. <laughs> they want to take, you know, the hundred a month or 200 a month. And, um, and what you get for that is uh, nothing. It's, it's a way of appealing to, um, the general public. Um, I've been always in the past very impressed with, with those fiction books that really have changed changed uh, things like like the jungle, um, and 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 that did something that just in that day and age with those people who are the the rich people uh, controlling these industries, um, nothing was going to get changed then either until the public really got behind it. And they said, all right, we're not gonna buy any more Frankfurters if we have to worry about who's in them. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's sort of my goal and um, hoping to use fiction to do that kind of thing. Well, you, you've been more, it's more than hope. You've been accomplishing it. And interestingly, if you go back, uh, Robin, you were uh, an activist through your work long before physicians took on that role. I mean, I think uh, what's also interesting is uh, uh, the physician authors, uh, like the three of us, um, we'd be happy if we had, you know, a a, a podcast, (laughs) but you are already writing the movie, which is kind of amazing. And you've had several movies, several movies and several TV um, shows. But one of the things I thought, you always seem to predict the future. And you may recall, you sent me this book, one of your many books, uh, Pandemic. Yes. And uh, you wrote, this is November 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, To Eric, I think you're going to enjoy Pandemic. Well, I want to just tell you, I'm not enjoying the pandemic. (laughs) Okay. But the fact that you do this stuff, I mean, the coma, obviously, so many times you're ahead of the curve. You're taking on subjects that are uh, so extraordinarily important, like in viral, the whole predatory insurance industry, which I think you did touch on to some extent in cell, because in cell, you know, the, these people were programming the insulin pumps through smartphones to kill people, right? To, to reduce their insurance burden. Right. So the villains, some of the villains are the same over the years, but the 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 fact that you can touch on such incredible issues and do it in a way where you can't be sued, <laughs> so, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah, uh, and I, I think for me the biggest thing was to learn. You know, when I went to college, um, with, to get good grades in order to get into medical school, you had to impress your your uh, professors somehow. And so any writing I did was always an attempt to impress 
the reader who was going to be one of my professors. And it's interesting when I decided to write not a fiction, I had to throw that idea out and realize that that's not the way you, you write fiction. You write fiction to, to not impress, but to entertain. And the interesting thing is, is that we're, in terms of entertainment, we're all more similar than we are different. We can tend to like sort of the same things. And uh, so uh, that was the biggest problem for me is going from wanting to impress readers to wanting to entertain them and give them a, a good time, so to speak. So they'll finish the book and, uh, um, and then hopefully think about things to some degree. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I was in, in college, in order to get to medical school, again, I you know it was very competitive. Um, I had to stay away from those hard courses like English or literature or writing. <laughs> Um, it, I, I had to, you know, plasma physics, I had to stay with things like that because you, if you, if you didn't know it, you put in more time and, uh, until you got to know it. And, uh, whereas you could spend all weekend writing a five page paper and you don't know whether you got an A or an F. <laughs> so in some respects, I think that Unfortunately, I missed a lot of really good things that might have made me a better person when I went to college. I went to a great college, very good liberal arts college, and, and had to steer clear of liberal arts. <laughs> so, yeah, that's just sort of an interesting point. Medicine and the Machine will be right back. Welcome to Medscape's latest podcast series, Medicine and the Machine. Featuring Medscape's Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Topol, and Master Storyteller and Clinician, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Remember, you can find the latest in medical news, expert perspectives, clinical tools, continuing medical education, and more at Medscape.com. I was going to, uh, I shared with Eric some time ago when I learned that we were going to get to talk to you, that many years ago at a at a conference, a drug company conference in Naples, I was taking a lesson with the teaching pro on the tennis courts and I looked over and the pro told me that's Robin Cook. And I was too much in awe of you to, to go up and talk to you. But I, I'm a very keen tennis player and I remember watching you and thinking that there was a metaphor there for your doggedness and for, for the way that you, you know, uh, successfully turned out bestsellers one after the other which harks back to this question about writing method. Do you have a, a method? I'm sure everybody asks you this, but do you have a method for each book uh, in terms of before you sit down, do you know where it's heading? Could you share some of that with us? Yes, uh, um, that's, I plan very, very much. Uh, I do very large outlines on very large pieces of paper, very tiny, tiny writing. So I can get as much as on that paper and I can then, make arrows and move things around. Um, because if anything, uh, during my uh, training, uh, the courses I took in college, uh, way back in the beginning of the computer age, et cetera, and learning how to program computers and, and how you did that, you had to be very, you had to know exactly where you were going and whatever. So I applied that same sort of methodology when I decided after my first book, I really didn't outline the first book very well, um, but Coma, I outlined extremely well and knew when I started writing, I knew everything that was gonna happen. And that's how I've continued to, to write my books. Um, and, uh, but that's a very frequent question, especially in a book like uh, Viral, because it kind of takes a right-hand turn um, and, um, and I, I've already gotten some feedback where people say, wow, where did that come from? <laughs> but I, I really do. I, if I was a, a, a more um, trained writer, I might not have to outline as much as I do. But, uh, but what I don't know is exactly what my characters are going to say. And, um, but I also do biographies of all the main characters. So I have a biography and then I have the storyline and 
as I, and I write from page one all the way to the end. And when I switch from one character to the other, I always go off and pick up my biography of that character and try to, try to sense that, uh, all right, yeah, that's right. Uh, that person thinks this way or, or whatever. And then the fun that I have when I'm writing my books is that um, sometimes the characters say things that I don't expect. <laughs> Um, just because you're, if you're in character and they're presented with a situation or a comment, and if you're in character, you say, well, you know, they might say this, and I hadn't planned on that. And sometimes that makes it a, a difficulty because <laughs> you have to get to the end of the, the scene has to go where I need it to go. So, but Well, and with respect to the key components, you've mentioned revenge. We've mentioned that you need to have a villain. Are there any other critical components of your successful template? I guess uh, you have to keep the pot sort of boiling in a certain sense. Uh, mm -hmm. And also I feel like I'm writing books about medicine, so I have to be quite accurate. Um, I spend a lot of effort when I write another book, if, if, it, if it deals with an issue that I don't have that much personal experience, um, or, or hadn't for a long time, uh, that I will go ahead and go back and, and talk to some specialists or mm -hmm. go back in the operating room, which I have done a couple of times, particularly one book. I can't remember what, which one it was, but it was going to have a, a serious, a couple of heart operation scenes. And although I had spent a lot of time doing that as a resident, hadn't done it for a long time. So I called up a friend. Luckily, I do have still have some friends, um, and uh, he invited me. Come on, you know, we'll scrub up. And so I went and scrubbed up and and did a few procedures. And uh, and same with uh, anesthesia. Um, the last couple of books have had some uh, anesthesia issues, um, so I did have to go back and and review that and. Uh, well, and you did it with uh, CRISPR genome editing, and I mean, you're 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 getting it accurate. I know this has been a consistent theme throughout. You know, I guess um, one of the questions that comes up right away is you've had 37 bestseller books, and you're talking about, you know, there might be people who are trained in writing. If you're not trained in writing, I don't know who is. But what, what's the next thing? Are you gonna Are you gonna keep writing? Yes, um, but I've also this year, because of the coronavirus, um, since I wrote Pandemic, I feel a little bit responsible. <laughs> and uh, uh, when it first started, um, I kind of looked at it and thought about it. And, um, and, and, I said, and I said, you know, the problem here, we're gonna have a vaccine, um, but the problem here is testing. And, um, uh, so I teamed up with three other people and um, we searched around and we've come up with a, a whole new way to test for coronavirus. Um, and so we started a company, uh, a testing company, and um, our machine uh, just a few days ago got the European approval, which is the equivalent of the FDA in Europe. And we're waiting for FDA approval as well. Um, so this is something that I've I've really put a lot of effort and time and and thought into. And uh, uh, as a physician, uh, to to be able to to do that because our test is very fast, it's very accurate and painless. Uh, so it's I think it's going to have a big a big impact. When you when you were attending the uh, Kennedy School of Government, were you thinking of a, a career in? in government? What was the motivation behind that? And it leads me to ask you whether you've considered running for office because Florida could possibly use some new ideas from oh my political goodness. leaders. <laughs> well, that is exactly the reason that I decided to go. And I thought since I thought I'm interested in public policy and someone with, with my kind of background and interest and whatnot, um, I thought that, that maybe I could, could say, become a senator. <laughs> you, know, you might as well think big. Um, but I have to tell you that the Kennedy School very quickly cured me of that idea. <laughs> uh, 
I, I realized that I was not cut out um, to be um, a politician. And the way they did it is because the Kennedy School, like the law school, like the business school, teaches in a case method. And the case method is that you're assigned um, uh, a point in some problem and you're assigned to be on one side or the other irrespective of what your beliefs are. And uh, I could understand the rationale for that, but I realized that that was very difficult for me. If I have a strong belief in something, I'm not gonna wanna compromise. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's why I was cured of that. And, and it was interesting because during the time as I was there uh, is when suddenly coma exploded and, and I realized I had another alternative way of hopefully influencing public policy. Well, you know, speaking of public policy, you already mentioned, of course, about COVID, but I would like to get your sense of where we are now, where we're headed, because you've when you've several of your books have been about infectious diseases and their impact. I know you've been following this very uh, carefully. Um, how what is your assessment right now of the U.S. and its Delta wave and, and where are we are headed from here? Unfortunately, I think that the coronavirus is going to be with us for some time, uh, maybe as much as influenza. Um, as most I guess, epidemiologists know, and um, I mean, I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, I, I knew that uh, I, I, I feared a pandemic was coming, which is why I wrote the book Pandemic. And it was a way of dealing with the CRISPR-Cas9 as a way of, of, of looking at the uh, of the possible bad side of CRISPR, CRISPR Cas9. But I had read a lot of material and I knew this pandemic was coming as they all did. In fact, I was probably the only person uh, that I had stockpiled N95 masks. <laughs> mm. uh, mm. And um, because I was sure it was gonna come and uh, I actually had a, have a, a, a small ski house way up in the mountains and I stocked it with the N95 masks and, uh, um, and with food, et cetera, that I could like Newton during the plague, he left London. I was gonna leave Boston <laughs> if need be and uh, hide out. Uh, uh, so um, I'm sorry, did I lose? Well, no, I think, well, that kind of exemplifies your futuristic thinking not at the level of book writing, but just how you practice your daily life, you know, planning ahead. But I was trying to get at, um, you know, you're, you're clear it's endemic. This country seems to be trying to do everything it could, can to do it badly, whether it was the initial pandemic management, whether it's the vaccination now. And, um, you know, we just can't seem to get out of this and do it right. <clears throat> I just wondered, you know, what your frank assessment was. I, it's great that you're working on a better testing um, uh, solution. That's just only one of the many dimensions of the problem, don't you think? Yes, um, and, but I think the, the real benefit, the thing that makes me feel the best is the fact that, that this um, COVID pandemic has really increased the, the need or, or shown the need in a very, very direct way of how important um, it is to have the infrastructure in place for vaccine development. Um, in 2010, I had written an article for foreign policy, and that was my main point, is that I, I really wanted, I was hoping that governments would pool money to, to increase the infrastructure for vaccine development so that it could be geared up much faster. Um, at that time, I didn't realize how important it was that the, the work that was being done in genetics was going to influence that. But anyway, to me, that's one of the things that makes me feel uh, able to go to sleep at night is that we, at least now we, we have realized the importance of the infrastructure for vaccine development, because there's going to be other infectious agents I really did not expect it to be coronavirus. I expected it to be um, influenza. And I tell you, when I 
when I stocked my ski house, et cetera, to live up there for three months, it was back when the, there was the swine flu and the bird flu at the same time in a section of China. And since I thought that if the bird flu and the, eh, and the swine flu got together because one was lethal and the other was transmissible, that we were gonna have, that was gonna be the problem. Um, I never expected the coronavirus because that's a common cold, et cetera. It's been around for a long time. You've been very generous uh, sharing your writing tips. And I know that our listeners will not forgive us if we don't ask you whether you write on a computer or on a, or on a, or on a pad. Um, well, I, I do both, a little bit of both. I still do all my note taking and, and, um, and my outlines uh, with pen and paper or pencil and paper. My first book I wrote longhand and several books after that, occasionally I would write portions of them longhand, but um, now I, I write on a computer. I've made the adjustment. Um, it's interesting, uh, when coma came out, um, there were quite a few doctors in my hospital who were a little bit jealous, I guess, and decided that they were gonna write a book. And um, I remember specifically one of them stopped me in the hall, grabbed my arm and said, Raman, guess what? He said, I've started on my novel. And I said, well, that's great, Jerry. I'm really pleased. He said, yeah, it's going really well. I'm on page 65 already. I said, wow, you're kind of moving along there. I said, what's it about? And he said, um, well, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> So that underlines the importance, I think, in writing um, at least novels that you you have a good outline and you know where you're going. Well, Robin, you're really a legend. And, uh, you know, in the community of physicians, uh, I don't know if there is anyone like you, no less just in general authors. Uh, so we want to congratulate you and yet another contribution uh, and hope that it won't be your last. But I mean, even if it was 37 books, I mean, it's and 400 million copies. That's pretty, that's out there. So, um, you know, you're, you're, you're amazing. That's all I can say. And you're just still going strong. I mean, you're just a phenomenon. Well, um, and I, I really do hope we at least get a public option. Um, I've come 180 degrees when I started out as a medical student, I didn't even like the idea of health insurance. Um, I felt that the, the relationship between a, a patient and, and a doctor should be very fiduciary based. And, uh, be, and each one values them, the, the input and uh, whatever. And, and insurance, health insurance, which originally was just to help for hospitalization, um, I think actually the whole concept of health insurance has been a disservice in the sense that it's the cause of, uh, of the inflationary pressure in medicine. Um, because people, you know, they, they have good health insurance. They don't even look at the bill. They went to the hospital and they had their appendix out. They don't even look at the bill. They don't care what it costs. And, and I think this has is, is been a green light for the, um, for the private equity people. Hey. Nobody cares what the cost is. Let's let's jack it up. No, I think um, I'm, just to close, Robin, I think the fact that viral gets into this critical issue about exploitation and predatory nature of our health system. It's great that you zoomed in on that. I do hope it'll have an effect. I know Abraham and I share your concerns about our lack of having universal health care and the business of medicine having led to erosion of the trust and the relationship uh, of uh, patients and their uh, clinicians. So thank you so much for this contribution and uh, for joining us today. Well, and we know the Medscape audience will, will get a kick out of it for sure. Well, thank you for inviting me. I really, I really did enjoy it as well. Thank you. Thank you.